Well, I'm happy it's Saturday morning, and I'm happy I can share it with you here on Bumper to Bumper Radio. He is Matt Allen, the KTR Car Guy, and I am Dave Riccio, the automotive therapist, and we are both here to help you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon, right here on News Talk and 92.3 KTR. Car questions, car concerns, all you got to do to get involved is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. We were going to be having open phones, but yesterday I was driving the car and I heard an ad on the radio for extended warranties. And I thought, man, are those things worth it? They have a bunch of great stuff they do. You can take your car anywhere. You can do all these things. You're never going to have to take your wallet out. And they pay for everything. Everything is covered. Rental cars, loaner cars, you name it. And I thought, hey, you know, are extended warranties worth it? I can tell you from my perspective in an auto repair shop, more negative stories and good stories as far as extended warranties go. What has been your find? Well, it all depends on the situation. It depends on the characters you're dealing with when you get the extended warranty. It all depends on your personal situation. You know, is a $800, $1,000 repair going to bring you to your knees? Well, I'm thinking or, of this. Right. You know, it, it, it just depends. Maybe... Maybe the warranty company's a good one. Maybe it's one of those shady characters where they're all at a phone bank somewhere in St. Louis, I think, is the capital of extended warranties. Well, I'm thinking of when I bought my Honda Element and sitting back there in the finance office and the the pressure to buy that extended warranty. I mean, they really lay it on thick. Oh, you got to have this extended warranty. And I, I'm i thinking, well, the car comes with a three or 36,000-mile warranty. I don't really know how long I'm going to own this car at this point. I don't know if I'm going to like it. I don't know if now is the time to purchase a warranty. And do I want to finance it? So if they sell me a 70,000-mile warranty, I'll just use that as a number, but the car's already covered for the first 36,000 miles. So basically I'm buying 40,000 miles worth of coverage. That You're buying 40,000 miles worth of coverage, and you're letting them have your money three years in advance too. Before you need anything. Yeah, so I mean, there's that's one thing. So I guess one of the questions, Dave, is do you do you need an extended warranty? That's the first thing. You have to figure that out for yourself, I guess, and and see how the contracts work. But then, when's the right time to buy one? Like you said, Dave, if you're buying a new car, my feeling is I want to hold my money as long as I can. That's your feeling, but my feeling is a little bit of you know what? I can just finance it all in there. This doesn't feel as such a such a big you know big deal. Hey, it's only seventeen bucks a month. <laughs> Right? <laughs> right? That's the sales technique. Break right. it down to the most minimal. It's only $17 a month. But when you add it all up, it's something more significant than that. But, yeah, I, I guess that does make it easier. Um, but that is one thing. If you're buying a new car, you don't need to buy that warranty. You can take your time. Don't succumb to the pressure of the salesman. Now, granted, they are some – what I think are some good warranties at some of the dealerships that they sell. But – Maybe you get into the more of the shady ones when you get into the used car lot type of places. Well, there's two types, and we should maybe clarify that. There's extended warranties or third-party warranties, and then there's service contracts. Those are two different things. A service contract, you're just prepaying for some of your maintenance going forward on the car. I'm thinking some of the European cars where they, they like to put the service contract in there for 50,000 miles. You're, well, You're not paying for... That's like BMW covers four-year, 50,000 mile. They're going to cover your oil changes, your wiper blades, your brake pads, whatever their, their advertising is. And that's not anything extra. That's just part of the car, and it's built in there somewhere. But they do have contracts where you can buy, oh, we'll take care of all your oil changes, all your maintenance, and everything. That's different than an extended warranty. So that's just, you're just, in those cases, you're just prepaying for oil changes, you're prepaying for your once a year air filter, maybe, or whatever the guidelines are that they use. And then I like to call these, well, maybe it's extended warranty, although it's not really a warranty. It's just an insurance policy. So it's health insurance for your car. Well, these third party warranties that go above and beyond the factory warranty that you have, the, the things that I don't like that I run into that I see is I'll have a vehicle in my shop and it needs a transmission. And that's why you buy the warranty is for that big repair, the transmission or any big engine problem. And so someone will have a transmission go out at eighty or 90,000 miles, which is a, a pattern failure for a particular vehicle, let's say, pretty common. And we call up the warranty company, and this guy's got a transmission that's bad, and we want to get started on fixing it. And they say, oh, you know what? We can get you a used one with 80,000 miles on it. Part of the fine print. Part of the fine print. And they have a like, kind, and quality clause inside the warranty that says they just got to restore it back to what it was before it broke. The problem with that is you have a 
a car that experiences a failure right at 80,000 miles, well, if they go get a used transmission out of a vehicle that has 75,000 miles on it, well, it's just going to fail in 5,000 miles. Well, that's why I say. You, your car that has this bad whatever it is right now, if it got wrecked five days ago, where would it have gone? If it was totaled, it would have gone to the junkyard. They like to call it recycling center. I think junk is now taboo because it's – Automotive dismantler. Dismantler is a nice way to put and it. recycler. But, but that's my, my point. Your car would have been there five days ago, so now we're going to go buy your bad transmission – in theory, and install it in your good car or, or, you know, Joe's old transmission. And now five days later, maybe that will go bad. Maybe it won't, but that's well, I think that's one of the possibilities. I think there's some false, false perceptions that are given when these things are sold. And they this thing well, covers well, 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 it. You think there's some? I know there's some, some mean, false that, perceptions. That, that, the shoe I mean, salesman is just, I mean, he's selling you this thing. He's saying, oh, this thing takes care of everything. Don't worry, for the next seven years, you're not going to pull your wallet out to take care of your car. you got deductibles, which are a big deal. Uh, and some of them have, you know, that's where you got to get into the fine print. Deductible, is it per repair? So you go in for a water pump and a valve cover, two different things. Is it per repair, per item, per component? You could, yeah, so you could have, a, let's say you have a $100 deductible. You have two different systems. Correct. So there's going to be, well, might the, be one deductible for one system, cooling system, or might be one for the engine system, if you will. Or valve cover gas. Most commonly, I relate to them like HMOs. A lot of them don't cover things like fluids. So you get a new water pump. The, the coolant's not included. The diagnostic is oftentimes not included. I'm seeing a few times they will pay diagnostic. But when we call these people to get authorized repairs, it, it's like pulling teeth to get them to pay. Well, or they want to fight about the labor rate. And they say, oh, you're $100 an hour. Well, you know, the, the national average is 82 well, maybe in the woods of Tennessee somewhere where some of these guys are, but I guarantee in the woods of Tennessee where the labor rate's $20 an hour, they're not paying those guys 82 Well, that's funny. I had a situation where they said, well, you know, in the average in Tempe is right now at about $104 an hour. That's the average labor rate. And uh, we were dealing with a warranty company. They said, the average in your area is $70. I said, well, where are you pulling that? And they had a list of body shops. Well, body shops have a significantly different labor rate than mechanical shops, and they were putting that in the mix, and that's how they, they kept the labor rate numbers down. Yeah. <laughs> what ends up happening, though, is the customer pays the difference. Um, so if you have one of those warranties and you do have a, you know, a major repair that you're facing, sometimes they're only willing to put the used transmission in, but you can pay the difference to get the nicer piece, and sometimes you may want to consider that if you are in that situation. And your repair shop should be helping you with that. And it, it's one of those cases where, Dave, you'll make that presentation. Sally, they want to install this used transmission. I've really tried to fight them to let us, let us properly fix, but it's more economical for them to put the used one in. Their out-of-pocket is going to be this much. Let's take and apply that used transmission value to having us do it the right way, and then you're better off. You're better off. So when we come back, we're going to have some tips as far as how to deal with warranty companies, what you want to look for, some pitfalls. And uh, we're taking calls at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. That song was a lot more fun to me back when Matt drove the Lincoln car. <laughs> but I had my hot rod, Lincoln. <laughs> Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen. Sometimes he's my friend, sometimes he's not. It just depends on his mood. So we are talking extended warranties. Do you need an extended warranty? Are they worth it? And I told you we would have some tips when we came back. And tip number one is you want what we call an exclusion Warranty. This would be on a third party. Well, warranty. when you're shopping for it, yeah. When you're shopping for it, correct. An exclusion warranty is where they're going to have certain exclusions, but they're spelled out. And the other type that would be the the con- well, it's a it's you have t- you have the kind that lists what's covered, and you have the exclusionary. The exclusionary is the one you want. And by the way, on bumper to bumper radio dot com, if you go there and go to face our Facebook link, we, we put a link up. There's a nice video that a guy did that talks about a lot of this stuff. But in any case, the exclusionary warranty, it covers everything except for what they have specifically included or excluded. Or the other one is just the opposite. It's got a list of what's covered. And guess what? If it's not on the list exactly as, it's not covered. And remember, these people want to pay as little as possible. That's how they make money. You give them money. At some point, they're going to have to give you some back for your repairs. 
but they're looking <laughs> the spread <laughs> between how possible. much you gave them and how much they give out. That's where they make their money. So it's in their best interest to to pay as little as possible. And the biggest tip I can give is to make sure you maintain your car because they come out when there's a big repair on a car. They send an inspector out and he looks at things like fluid and tires and he, I've seen him cancel a warranty because someone changed the tire size. Maybe they went up a size and they, they'll they'll rule it out and someone's looking at a $2,500 transmission repair bill and they thought they've had this uh, false security blanket for all these years of this warranty and here it is. Glad I bought it. Oh, guess what? It's not covered because you modified the vehicle. Yeah, with, and, with the and slight half tire. of that, that's a, that's a baloney excuse to, to come up with something. I mean, we had an inspector come out for an air conditioner on a Honda CRV. You know, not a... Not, too old of a car, like a 2004, 100,000 miles. He's confirming that the AC compressor is bad. We've got it on the bench. We're showing them. And they it's standard for them to take a picture of the VIN number, take a picture of the odometer. But he's checking the transmission fluid. He's checking the cooling system. He's What they're doing, they're looking to make sure you're maintaining the car. So you don't. If you got one of those warranties, you don't want to skip maintenance because well, they, they'll actually it'll be no good when it's time to use it. In a prime example too, we had a Land Rover. Land Rover it only wants an oil change every so often. I mean, it's not that much. It's maybe fifteen thousand miles. Although we never recommend doing that, we want to cut those a little bit shorter. The the warranty companies they specify you have to have an oil change every thirty seven hundred fifty oh, miles yeah, or six that months. That was a big deal because the guy was off. He was off in Afghanistan was, and yeah, he, he didn't get his oil changed too. in a timely fashion. Yeah, so the, he was well within the mileage, but he missed it by twenty days on the oil change. So they're trying to cancel the the deal for that. It had nothing to do with anything, but they want to not pay out. So, um, you know, another one would be if you have already have an accident warranty and you sell your car, maybe your car got totaled, you got in a car accident, and you have this warranty, don't just let that go away. You can cancel that and get your money back. I did not know that. Yeah, you can cancel those and get some money back. And then the other thing is if you don't need to finance it, you don't have to buy it right away. Don't buy it right now today, especially if you're buying a new car. Now, a used car... You should do your shopping, and you can always check with your insurance companies and whatever. But uh, Well, I think and that's the other point is you sh- should check with your insurance company, who you already have a relationship with. A lot of insurance companies already offer it, and it's not some fly-by-night. And the fly-by-nights is what you got to be aware of. Find out who's back in this warranty because these things fire up, sell a bunch of warranties, and they can't make their claims. Well, someone's already off with the money. It's kind of a Ponzi scheme. So. Exactly. Anyway, up for this segment, we've got Michael in Peoria on a 1999 Toyota Corolla. Go ahead, Michael. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, now, I took about a 500-mile trip to uh, California, you know, for the Christmas. And um, and then I woke up, you know, and did a little running around. Then I noticed my, um, after about a couple of days, I was ready to leave. My light came on, my engine light, you know, and um, the car's always been running good, and it still runs good, and I've been checking it the last couple of weeks because I haven't taken it in, and there's absolutely nothing wrong whatsoever that I could see. What do you think I should do, or do you have any ideas what it might be? Uh, Michael, first thing is, what color is that light? Red, and so the engine check. Okay, well, red, you know, let's, let's, there's a couple different engine lights that you're going to see. You're going to have red, which, let's look at this like your stop lights. Red is danger or stop. Yellow, which is your check engine light for emissions or drivability. Amber, yellow. Warning, caution. So if you do have a red engine light on, that is a problem. may not be a huge problem. It could be low oil pressure uh, from low oil, which is a, is a big deal, especially if you're making a trip to California. You could have just simply a bad oil pressure sensor causing that light to come on. Right. Now he said the car seems to be running fine. And the one thing, the reason we have these lights is because the computer is more sensitive to an issue than we are. It knows way ahead of time uh, there's an issue. And sometimes it goes the opposite way. You can feel something before light actually turns on. But a lot of times it's way more perceptive to pick up a problem than you are. Yeah. And this is a, this is more of a mechanical issue, I would imagine. Uh, so you're in Peoria, Michael. If you went to bumper to bumper radiocom there's all kinds of great shops in Phoenix that can take care of this if you're looking for a mechanic or a shop. And Dave's Car Care is in Peoria at 51st Avenue and Peoria. That might be a good place to start if you don't already have a shop. Thanks so much for the call, Michael. Let's go with Todd and Gilbert on a 2004 Tahoe. Go ahead, Todd. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, good morning, guys. Thank you for taking my call. <clears throat> hey, I got a uh, 2004 Chevy Tahoe. We just uh, rolled over 106,000 miles. And... Uh, for some reason, my thermostat, it will blow 
the AC will blow cold on the passenger side vents, and the heater will blow hot on the passenger side vents. However, on the driver's side, the vents, it's just a constant warm. It's never cold, and it's never really hot. And is this when you're trying to make hot air or when you're trying to make cold air? It's both. Okay. If I'm making air, if I, like, if, if the air condition's on, the whole passenger side vents work perfectly fine. But then if I have, you know, the air condition on, the vents on the driver's side is just blowing really hot okay. air. Well, I'm thinking... Just- Okay, I'm thinking a couple, a couple different things. If it was the summertime and you were telling me it's cold on one side and not so cold on the other, we've seen where just a low charge of the air conditioning system will cause that, that difference on either side. And if you've got the dual system, his and hers, if you will, there's actuator doors in there that direct that airflow over to whether it wants hot air or cold air, and it directs it over the air conditioning or the heater just to make it simple. Those motors go bad. And so that that's probably what you have. You could try playing with the temperature selectors and maybe go maximum, come off of that, you know, try that, and maybe come off max just a little bit and see if that has any any change on it. But it, it's going to be something with the dash controls, more likely, probably not a charge issue, but not a big deal either. Thanks so much for the call, Todd. You know, I noticed that Toyota is in the news again. $1.3 billion they had to set aside. And these guys can't get away from these recalls. No, well, and we just had GM yesterday announced a recall on at least it's only 2013 models. There's not very many of them on the streets yet. For uh, oh, I don't even know what it was, but it seems like there's always something going on. Well, for Toyotas, it's runaway Toyota. So any repairs, they got a guarantee for runaway issues. When we come back, we've got Tom, Hank, and Chad. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen, and we've got Rob, Tom, and Chad, and a couple open lines waiting for you at 602-277-5827. 60, huh? I'm sorry. Well, you got to cut me off. <laughs> I think Frank dropped off because you called him Hank. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, up first a segment, we're going to go with Tom in Scottsdale on a 1993 Pontiac Bonneville. Go ahead, Tom. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, hey, good morning. Uh, uh, I had a quick question for you. It's got a 93 Bonneville. It uh, has 125,000 miles on it, um, about 80,000 more highway miles from uh, being my dad's old company car. Um, I was recently driving it. didn't get a lot of use. It's more or less just in the garage. I pulled out every few weeks. I was driving it, and uh, it, I, I was at a stop by. I gave it gas, and it seemed like I was uh, spinning the wheels on ice. And I gave it more gas, and eventually... It seemed like it kicked in the gear. Uh, would that be the transmission slipping or going, or does it need transmission service? Well, have you checked the transmission fluid at all? Uh, yeah, it, it was full. I, I haven't had any transmission service done on it in some time, but like you said, it doesn't get more than maybe 3,000 miles a year um, driven. So was it just that one time that when it took off, you felt like you were on ice, or has it happened more consistently I, than that? Yeah, it did it. When I was driving, I did it twice at two different stoplights. But then I, I got home, and I was in the neighborhood, and I stopped to start it, put it in reverse, put it in drive, couldn't get it to duplicate. Okay. I am thinking that, uh, you know, it could very well, 1993, Bonneville, those seals are pretty pretty old. They've been in, sitting in that ATF for a lot of years. We may start to be having some damaged seals. It did sound a little bit like a low fluid symptom sometimes when you give it gas. If they're a little bit low on fluid, well, that gas sloshes or that fluid, fluid sloshes, sloshes in the pan, and then the uh, transmission takes a gulp of air. So and it, it's got to have a consistent pressure in order to go. You know, and there's there's one thing that Tom said, too. It said maybe it just needs a service. And, no. and that's one thing that oftentimes, like, we'll – put it into like a cooling system. People say, oh, my car's overheating. I need to get a radiator flush. No. Those two things, whether you know, whether it's any kind of flush or service or fluid maintenance, it's exactly that, maintenance. I mean, maybe once in a while you might get away with doing a transmission service and, and you improve your problem, but you maybe only improved it because it was low and the service corrected the low problem, or you fixed the leak by changing the filter and that corrected the leak. But services typically aren't fixing anything. And they don't usually do. And if there is a if there is a problem, you can actually make it much worse. But by servicing the transmission, I do have people come in and say, I, "I'm having transmission issues. I need a service." We say, "Well, let, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's find out what's wrong first, because we don't want to make it worse." You know, uh, 
if we can hang on for a while and prepare for a transmission repair, that's better than, you know, servicing it and being dead right there in the parking lot. Or you service it, pull the pan down, put a new filter on, put all the fluid in, then go diagnose it, and then go find out that you've got to just redo everything you just did because now you've got to get to the valve body to fix a... Some little uh, some other, yeah. thing. Yeah. There is a few instances where uh, transmission service will fix it. You know, you know, torque converter chatter uh, is, is one of them where, a, you know, fresh fluid in there will help with that chatter. You know, that's the case. In the older days, when the filter is like a turbo 350, man, they, they made a lot of garbage on the inside, and they would plug up the filter. And you could change the filter, and they still had a lot of life in them. But those days, <laughs> yeah, but they were they were limping though. But they were limping. But those days are gone. So when I find when you do service them, and, and now it doesn't go anywhere, it's you're worse off. Well, and the other thing too is let's not make the mistake, Tom, of going. You might have a perfectly fine transmission. Don't fall into the thing. Oh, put some brake fluid in the transmission, or or go buy an additive because sometimes those old snake oil tricks of of yesteryear of the 60s and 70s will work but if that's not if your problem can be corrected by one of those little tricks let's say it's not a seal you might fatten the wrong seal and now you've created a whole problem that you didn't have so be cautious of of uh, snake oils and tricks too well thanks so much for the call tom let's go with chad in mesa it looks like a 1998 ford contour go ahead chad you're on bumper to bumper radio Morning. Uh, thanks for having me and taking my call. Um, I have uh, a 98 Contour with 115,000 miles on it. I bought it last year. It's been my uh, daily driver. I'm hoping to um, that this thing stays alive for another year and a half while my girlfriend's going through school, and then we're going to get a different car. Um, we I have uh, four different tires on the car, um, three of which um, I've replaced. Um, with just cheap used tires because, like I said, it being my um, just kind of a cheap daily driver, I, I didn't really feel a need to invest in, you know, $500 for a new set of tires or anything. So my issue is when I take it out on the highway and I get to about 60 or 65 miles an hour, it vibrates as if um, one of the tires um, needs to be balanced but the real issue is what I noticed that seems odd to me is that it'll vibrate for about 10 seconds and then it'll clear up to be smooth for about three seconds and then it'll vibrate again for about 10 seconds and then clear up and be smooth for like three seconds. And that is all happening at the same consistent, say, 55 or 62 or whatever mile per hour you're driving? That's right. I've even set it on cruise control just to be certain. Hmm. <laughs> It's got gremlins, Dave. What do you think? I don't know. It's it's weird that would come and go. And that is weird. Go. You I, know, I've seen when a tire's out of balance at 62 miles an hour, the vibration is there, but at 63, it's gone. I've seen that. Oh, yeah, of course. But if he's got the cruise control set right at 62 and it wah, 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 you know, I kind of, maybe it's just a harmonic, you know, because I'm, I'm thinking tires still, though. I, but to come and go, I'm thinking maybe motor mounts grounding down. I, <laughs> That's it. I haven't heard that. I guarantee you. I wonder if you just Googled Ford Contour harmonic vibration or something like that and to see what you might come up with. Is that how you guys fix cars over there at Virginia Auto? Once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I would say rotate your tires and see if something changes. I would start there. Well, yeah. I mean, rotate them. Just put the front ones on the back, back ones on the front, see if just, anything changes. Just see if you can change. It needs a test drive by somebody with some experience. And isn't Tri State Transmission really good at finding vibrations, Dave? <laughs> we are, but maybe he, maybe you can Google. Maybe <laughs> Google can drive the car. You know, they do, they they do can, pretty they much do anymore. That. All right. Chad, hopefully, you know, you, <laughs> something that is out there for you if you ch need to check a bumper to bumper shop for a test drive or certainly send us an email at bumper to bumper radio.com and we can try and help you we're joking a little bit but that's a, that's just a strange problem so it's not solved over the radio on a saturday for sure well we've got open lines at 602-277-5827 602-277-KTR let's go with tyler in scottsdale on a 2003 grand cherokee go ahead tyler you're on bumper hey good morning thank you for taking my call I had a uh, check engine light come on, and I had the code read. It's a P1763 code. It's been intermittent. It came on once, and it's gone away, but it says it's a governor pressure sensor voltage too high. Uh, what, what's the possible cause for this? It didn't say there's any correction available for it. I think that's yeah, right up Dave's alley. There definitely is. On the uh, on the Grand Cherokees, that's a 40, 46RE transmission that's in there. 
And uh, they are notorious for having governor pressure sensor issues and governor pressure solenoid issues. It's almost a weekly repair at Tri-City Transmission. And it, you, do a, you do a transmission service, you remove the valve body, and you go to those. I mean, just telling you most commonly, there could be a shorted wire somewhere else or a voltage issue, but the most common is, you know, the pressure sensor is, is starting to have an issue. So that's a pattern, what we somewhat call of a pattern failure. Pattern failure, correct. So I don't think you're looking at a major repair, but something you do want to get addressed. You don't want to, if you've got a pressure issue or a pressure sensor problem, it can cause a bigger issue because it, it may apply the wrong line pressure in the transmission. Or not enough or too much or cause slipping or hard, hard shift. It could be a very small problem turn into a big one if you don't address it. Thanks so much for the call, Tyler. Let's go with Rob in Phoenix on an F-150. Go ahead, Rob. You're on bumper to bumper. Good morning. My question is about an extended warranty. I just bought a, uh, a used 2008 Ford F-150. I love the truck and want to stay with it for as long as I can. But they wouldn't give me an extended warranty or sell me one because it had 105,000 miles. I financed it through the credit union. They just called me and said, hey, we'll sell you one three years, 36,000 miles, but it's $2,026. Since I would finance it, I'd be looking at about $70, uh, $50 a month of sleep insurance, and I'm just not sure whether or not I should even look at that. And it doesn't have stock tires on it, so would I be uh, already violating that warranty the minute I started paying for it? Well, yeah, that's, that's funny because the tire issue is I've seen it. I've seen them rejected because the, the vehicle's been now been modified. So right. you would have to look in the fine print of the specific warranty that the credit union is selling to know if it really fits, you know, fits your need. All right. Yeah, and maybe do that by email too, and say, "Hey, um, salesperson, you know, I want to be clear. My truck has has uh, large size tires. They're not the factory, and at least document that through that process, right. so that somebody else doesn't come back and say, whoa, 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 we didn't know that.' You know, right. you know. But I always want to argue. I had a I had a um, a diesel truck, and it wasn't running right, and I had it lifted. And it's a common problem on these, or not too common. Maybe at the time it, there was some frequency of them. But the wiring harness would chafe, and it would short out the fuel injector wiring harness. This was covered under the factory GM warranty. Oh, you're, you've got a lift kit on that truck. Well, what the heck does a lift kit have anything to do with a wiring harness? I can understand if we had snapped a drive shaft or busted a U-joint. Something related or something like that. Yeah, your lift kit. Yeah. yeah, it's like you know you got an ingrown toenail because you know you had a cavity. Come on. Has nothing to do with it. <laughs> well, thanks so much for the call, Rob. We're, when we come back, we're taking calls at 602 277 5827, Bumper to Bumper Radio. Welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen, and we are taking your calls at 602 277 5827, 602 277 KTAR. This is the first show of 2013. Are you going to lose is. more weight or what? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> what's so, your what's your biggest New Year's resolution? Not to make New Year's resolutions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make any. I just uh, I made mine early, I guess. If you're going to the gym in January, the funny thing about the gym is you cannot find a piece of equipment to work out on because everybody's got their New Year's resolution and they're all there. It's kind of like Mondays at the gym. It's a ghost town in March. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's everyone's fell off. Well, you know, I was at Costco the other day, and uh, everywhere. You, I, I have my pattern down. I know what's where, and you kind of get to the one side where they've got shampoos and soaps and vitamins. There was more whey protein and this loss and that loss and insure this and insure that and this, you know, s something solution to drink and this pill to pop. And there was more of that stuff that wasn't there two weeks ago. This is like the New Year's resolution aisle. These people know when to put that stuff out. So, but. Up for this segment, let's go with Jay in Phoenix on a 2006 Nissan Murano. Go ahead, Jay. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah. Hey, Dave. Matt, Happy New Year. Thank you. You too. Um, thank you. I uh, got a 2006 Murano, and it has about 127,000 miles on it. Um, it's been a great car. Uh, I've done all the routine maintenance myself. Um, but at about 55, 60,000 miles, I started noticing an oil leak. Um, I had it evaluated, and... They said, if you're mechanically inclined enough, you can go ahead and fix it yourself. And what it is is apparently where the oil filter um, screws into the motor itself, there is an oil cooler unit. And behind that oil cooler unit is a seal that seals that 
cooler unit to the block. Yes. Now, the problem is, is that that's where the leak is originating. And they said to replace that seal, it should solve my problem. Well, I've replaced that seal over the last 60, 70,000 miles about three times, and I just, for some reason, cannot get it to seal enough to where I don't get a small drip um, or a reoccurring leak. Now, once, obviously, once I get to driving temperature with the heat, it expands and the leak stops. Sure. Um, but I, I noticed that once I park the vehicle, then I have, that's when it, it drips into my driveway. Okay. And, and I don't know if this is a reoccurring problem that other Nissan Murano people are having or if it's common for Nissan or what, but how do I get this thing to seal enough to where I don't have a consistent leak. Well, I guess the first thing, we need to make sure that that really is the leak. So if you sound like you're pretty convinced, and that is a fairly common problem, let's make sure to clean it off. And you may be able to clean it off, get underneath the car, raise it, properly support it with jack stands or whatever you have to do, and actually sit there and watch it until it leaks so you know for sure that that's the leak and it's not coming from somewhere else. But Mm -hmm. the other thing I would say, are you getting that seal from Nissan? I am, and I've been paying the 15 13 to 15 dollars that it cost and you know it's funny that you mentioned that because the last time i bought it the guy at the nissan dealer said suggested that there is a oil filter that has the same diameter seal as the oem now you, that comes you, from you, nissan. you don't want to get involved with that i mean it used to be that we could we had to replace the whole oil cooler. You couldn't buy that seal separately. So you just need to make sure that you're getting that clean. Make sure the seal is not falling out. Sometimes you can. there's a groove that that seal sits in on that oil cooler. Put a little bit of grease in there, like wheel bearing grease, that will hold that seal in place when you go to, to bolt it up to the block. And then make sure you're not over-tightening it. I doubt that tar- over-torquing that thing would smash that seal enough to have it leak that that soon again but that's a fairly common problem and you shouldn't be having having issues like that that's a bit of a strange one you just make sure to pinpoint clean off and make sure that it is in fact the leak and try maybe try a different oil filter if you're not using you know if you're using the orange ones from checker auto just pick a different brand and see if that helps for some reason i can't imagine that it would though thanks so much for the call jay let's go with kyle on a 2004 grand am go ahead kyle you're on bumper to bumper yeah, thanks, gentlemen, for uh, hearing my call. Yes, I've had this 2004 Pontiac Grand Am uh, since 2005. The car's been a fantastic car, but about last year sometime, I was experiencing a problem with my car stalling as I was driving. It would just kind of turn off as if I turned my key off or if it ran out of gas or if I lost electricity in my car. And, and what I would do is either pull over or I'd throw it into neutral, start my car again my car would start and i'd go on but there had been times when it would happen once or twice a day and then it went an entire year and stopped doing it uh just two or three days ago my car is doing the same thing and as i said it's just i don't know if it's an electrical issue or if it could be a gas or fuel line or pump issue um but i can't really diagnose it uh until it happens it's like i'm getting no warning signs now you know how we feel sometimes. I mean, <laughs> with the intermittent. Now you said it. I thought I heard you say it loses electricity. He thought it might be okay. Well, okay. right, and I don't know. It's like everything still works. My radio and everything works, but it's just like I turn my key off right while I'm driving, and my car just like just dies. Just and then no, I get my and then I get my service engine light on, and then I push it neutral, and I start it. And it starts, and I move on. I think the service engine light is normal because that's just what happens when you turn the key to the on position. And essentially, that's all you've got. If the engine stalls, the key is in the on position. So, but it, it just goes in. The, those are always the toughest ones. That intermittent just goes and just shuts off for no reason, and then you go crank and start it again. Right. Gosh, and it, it could be all it. the above. I mean, you mentioned things like fuel. You know, it could be a fuel issue. It could be an electrical issue could be a crank sensor issue, you know, drop it out. So, you know what, if you send us an email at bumper to bumper com on the contact link, I will do some research of, you know, the, the known problems for the 04 Grand Am and see if there's anything in there that fits your symptom and, and kind of the consistency of what's yeah. going on. You know, I had an 88 Mustang GT one time cruising along and it just stalled. I mean, no reason. I'm on the side of the 51, 
trying to figure this out. Wouldn't start, wouldn't start. You know, and nowadays you open the hood, you see somebody broken down on the side of the road and they've got the hood open. I think to myself, <laughs> there's <laughs> nothing you can do. I mean, I can't even do anything. If I right. was broken down on the side of the road, there, there, there's not much to do there yourself. So... Anyway, I got a, yeah, I got a text from Joel from Arizona Imports, and he a, said a on that Murano, there is definitely an updated seal for it here in the in the in the recent, and he said there's a the oil pan is actually leaking. He said, uh, let me see if I can read his text. Uh, lower oil pan is leaking. So, anyway, you might check into that when you're down there at the parts department. Thanks for sharing your Saturday with us. Uh, hope we lowered some of your automotive anxieties. If you have a great shop, stick with them. If you're looking for a good mechanic, bumper to bumper radio.com. While you're there, be sure to like us on Facebook and send us emails if you have questions and show topics. If there's something that you want to talk about or you have, you need some information, you have a question, ask us. We'll incorporate that into the show. He's Matt Allen. I'm Dave Riccio. See you next week.